welcome to episode 61 of the Frog Bit Bog podcast and weird music to start with, but I'll tell you why later. In fact, there's quite a few songs on this week, funnily enough, and a couple of sketches and all the usual features. Um, I've not got Lenny, but I've got Mark, who's in Thailand, and he sent us a report. Um, so, um, yeah, well, um, just uh, listen on then. Hey, yeah, I'm uh-huh, um, okay. Right, well, you may be wondering why I did that weird beginning. Well, actually, it was a tribute. Um, I lost another friend recently, um, and that music is a song that we co-wrote just over 30 years ago. I wrote the tune and he came up with the words. Well, when I say I wrote the tune, is I sort of ripped off a Patsy Klein song and he came up with the words. Um, we are through with bubble gum and Coca-Cola. We're going to change from nuclear to solar. And remember, this is back in the 80s. And and the president that's mentioned in the song was President Reagan. Um, but anyway, Jeff died last weekend. Um, and he was one of life's true originals. He was like this real cartoon character in real life. And he used to have, always wear these massive baggy shorts and had skinny legs and always some kind of weird headgear. And he was a great cartoonist, a great ukulele player, great lyricist. And last year we actually all met up and had a 30-year reunion gig down at, at a barn somewhere in Suffolk with a load of people. So I did get a last chance to play with it. Um, and it was filmed. So in the process of making the documentary on the subject, I'm, I'm so glad that we all met up last year and had one last chance to play together anyway. So um, Jeff Dixon died last week. So um, rest in peace, Jeff. So what's England good at? Well, I've covered a few things over the past few weeks, but it turns out we're rather good at lying about unemployment figures because apparently more millions more people in Britain are without jobs than um, shown by official unemployment figures, according to a study that suggests the jobless rate should be almost three times higher. According to research from the OECD and the Centre for Cities Think Tank, large levels of hidden unemployment in towns and cities across Britain are excluded from official government statistics. Surprise, surprise. Um, The study found that more than 3 million people are missing from the headline unemployment rate because they report themselves as economically inactive to government labour force surveys. So there you go. We are good at something in this country, in England. We're really good at hiding, hiding the unemployment. Employment figures. Hooray! Right, well, um, my phone's falling apart. You know, I've had it for a few years. I got it handed down off Mary. Um, and the battery lasts about an hour these days, which is rubbish because I use the phone um, more than anything as a camera. Um, so when I go in the woods and I'm out and about, I actually take photographs of mushrooms. I don't really want to pull them up unless I'm going to eat them. So I take photographs of mushrooms and I'll take one photograph and the phone will die. So I'm really loath to replace it because I don't, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, um, I don't want to be part of all that that nonsense and I just want to keep it as long as I can. But coincidentally, an article came up um, and I don't know about you, I've never heard about this company. So I think my next purchase for a phone is going to be one of these and it's called the Fairphone and it's, ethic- and it's ethically possible as it can be. Um, And this is what it says. There are two things to love about Fairphone's ethics. The first is that you can fix it yourself incredibly easy. It's modular so that you can separate the components and replace them as required or even upgrade them. Our friends at iFixit gave it 10 out of 10 for repairability. Key components like the battery and screen have been prioritized in design and are accessible either without tools or just with regular Phillips screwdriver. Replacement guides and spare parts are available by the manufacturer's website. In fact, when you look at the website, you can buy every component in the phone separately because they say the most sustainable phone is the one you already own, which is brilliant, isn't it? Because it's that built-in obsolescence that we've got in society. So they actually start making phones where you can actually just replace it bit by bit and just keep fixing it and make it last longer and longer. That's great. And it also says they also try and source every material to ensure that it is fair and try to avoid conflict materials. And that means those related to conflicts in countries 
countries, um, like for when they for gold and other components, and everything is sourced as fairly as it possibly can be, which is just brilliant, isn't it? Imagine um, getting a phone that you can then fix it yourself when you need to. So that's the fair phone. So I think the next phone I'm going to get is definitely going to be one of them. Right, well, I've been reading this week about the Eden Project. I don't know if you know the Eden Project. It's down in Cornwall, and the, the, the purpose behind it is to demonstrate the importance of plants to people, how important they are, and to promote sustainable use of plant resources. And I've never been, um, but it's meant to be pretty impressive. But not only that, but now it's going geothermal. Yeah, ooh, get you geothermal with your big words, yeah. And what it says, a plan to heat the giant biomes of the Eden Project and eventually neighbouring communities by tapping into the hot rocks beneath the Cornish attraction has moved a step closer. The Eden Project announced on Monday that it had secured the funding to begin drilling for clean energy next summer. Cornwall Council and the European Union, remember them, have provided the bulk of $16.8 million needed to launch the geothermal project, which will initially involve a well well being, not a well being, a well being sunk almost three miles into the granite crust beneath Eden, because beneath Eden there's a granite crust. Um, the first phase of the project will be drilling a well, um, a research program, and a heat main um, to provide how to, to work out how much resource there is down there. Yep. And it says the first well will initially supply a heating system for the Eden biomes, offices and greenhouses. It is intended to pave the way for the second phase, another well almost three miles deep and an electricity plant. Now, presumably an electricity plant isn't like the plants that they've got inside the biome. I think it means a plant, you know, the different kind of plant. There's, there's lots of different kinds of plants. You know what I'm saying here? Anyway, the bloke that's doing it says geothermal will be a game changer for Eden, Cornwall and the UK. Once up and running, our plant will provide more than enough renewable electricity and heat for the whole site as well as the local area. Isn't that good? You see what happens um, when us humans put our minds to things. We can find solutions, can't we? A Macariah's old cowboy Cause autumn is here so it's into the woods I go a mycorrhizal old cowboy yeah, so I've been doing my mycorrhizal cowboy thing and I've been looking, I mean, I don't pull loads up. I think it's important to, to, to stress this, that really we shouldn't all go yanking fungus up just for the sake of it. So I do take my camera and photograph them, unless I'm sure what they are, um, and I might pick them up to eat them. But even then, I um, I'm, like, for example... The past couple of weekends, I found loads of this thing called hedgehog fungus. And the reason why it's called hedgehog fungus is it's unique is it doesn't have gills underneath. It has lots of little spiky spines that as soon as you pick it up, you can brush them off and they fall, you know, they fall everywhere. And it's pretty unmistakable. Um, and I keep finding loads of it. And amongst when I, when I go and find loads of it, some of it's already broken off and fallen off the stem. So I'm picking them up and leaving the main bits of mushroom because, you know, it is part of the ecosystem. So if you're going to forage, at least, you know, I think we all have to think about doing it responsibly. But I've been, I've been eating lots of hedgehog fungus. And I know I'm a sad twat, but I actually put a picture on Facebook because I cooked a stroganoff of hedgehog fungus. And of course, I got all the usual replies. Ugh, yeah, ugh. I mean, don't people eat mush mushrooms? It's just a different type of mushroom. Anyway, I'm going off Facebook. I don't think I'm going to go on there anymore. Not because of that. I just, social media is just doing my head in. Um, so anyway, yeah, I've been eating hedgehog fungus and it's been really really lovely um and there's two i found out there's two uk mushrooms that will kill you one's called the death cap and one the other one's called the destroying angel um well there's a sort of clue in the name there isn't there love do you want some destroying angels on toast is it safe to eat don't know sounds it um yeah, well, I actually think I might have found a destroying angel today in, in the woods and I sort of, I didn't pick it up, but I took photographs of it and cleared the, the, the soil around it and stuff to get a proper look at it. 
And it's really interesting when you're looking at a mushroom that might kill you. It's like looking into the eyes of a, of a killer. You know what I mean? You're looking into the, well, you're not really looking into the eyes. You're more looking into the gills of a killer. But it's quite interesting. So, yeah, death cap and destroy an angel, avoid them. But generally, avoid picking too many. You know, just photograph them and, and get to know all the parts of nature that are around us. Because, you know, the mycorrhizal network is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And that's the reason why I'm a mycorrhizal cowboy. Cause fungus and mushrooms have heard they're really good for my health. Unless I end up poisoning myself. <laughs> Hello, we're English and we don't speak another language because we expect the world to do all the hard work and learn English. Um, can we have a ticket to Vatican City? Um, do you speak English? See, a third to plastic pot, please. What? In English, we no speak a dialingo. A third to plastic pot, please. In English. I am speaking English, you bloody fool. The fair is 30 plastic bottles. Oh. Yeah, um, 30, this, seriously, this is a great idea. 30, 30 bottles, 30 plastic bottles will buy you a ticket on a subway bus or bus in Italy. In an effort to promote recycling and cut down on litter in the streets, the city of Rome has introduced a new initiative called Ricchilili Via Gogo, Via Gigi, or something like that, or Recycle and Travel. People can bring plastic bottles to a metro station, insert them in a machine that crushes and sorts them, and gain digital credits that go towards transit fares. The machines offer only five cents a bottle regardless, so it takes 30 bottles to earn the standard one euro fifty fare. Um, but it's it, you know it might seem a lot, but or not a lot, but it's great because pe apparently people have been queuing up to to use it. And um, so far, the machines are only available in three stations: Cipri. Pyramid and San Giovanni. But if they prove to be successful over the course of 12 months, the project will be expanded further. Paolo Simoni, president of Rome's Republic Transport et Network, ATAC, said, In a period in which cryptocurrency is talked about, we have a plastic currency. Substantially, it's a system in which one recycles, we build customer loyalty, and citizens' virtuous behaviour is rewarded. Isn't that bella bella, as they say? Mark, talk, Mark, talk. Tell us your tales if you've been swimming with whales. Mark, talk, Mark, talk. Tell us your news if you've been racing emus. Mark, come on, Mark. Lovely Mark, talk, Mark. A lovely Mark, talk, Mark. Yeah, well, I'm quite excited about the next bit because remember, um, we said a while back that Mark was on his travels. Well, he's in Thailand and he's actually sent me um, a report, so I'm going to play that now. Yes, Mark is on his travels. Um, and so I'm just going to hand over to him and he's done this report. It's not an interview, he's just done the report. But before I want to do that, I want to say congratulations to him because his film, and I, I told you the other week that he's got a film out called The Dirty Weekend that we went to see and it was brilliant. And it's actually being shown um, beginning of November at the Sydney Film Festival in Australia in the comedy section. So if you're over there in Australia or you're Australian and listening, get yourself to the Sydney Film Festival in the comedy section and go and see Mark's Dirty Weekend. So congratulations, Mark, and over to you. Tell us about what's been going on. Hello, it's Mark here, the minimalist and filmmaker. I've uh, been a regular or semi-regular on the, the Frogbit blog podcast for the, over the past few months. Uh, I'm currently on my Thailand trip. Um, I am reading this from the Surin province of Thailand, which is about seven hours northeast of Bangkok. Uh, so my first week I spent on a school and we were doing some working in a group of eight people who'd come over from, uh, well, seven of us were from 
the UK with one extra person from Europe being a German guy called Dominic, who's a good crack. Uh, so we've been working on a school and I've found some quite interesting things and things that uh, are worthwhile reporting back on. One of the biggest things was that I've found is the, um, the how poverty relates to happiness. Um, these people are seemingly in quite, quite, significant states of poverty but that hasn't affected their happiness in any way that I thought it would um, I think in the UK we're always brought up to to chase money and be in a country which um, we are like the, the country as general is I always want to have very good economy and everyone earns quite a lot and you're always you know the, the culture is to work hard get paid more um, and then have the money taken off you <laughs> through the tax man and have the top 1% elite cream off all the wealth. But um, that's not the case here. And I don't think that affects happiness in the, in the, in the country at all. Um, some of the people I've met from these quite poverty stricken areas are some of the, the happiest, friendliest people I've ever seen in my life. So it's been, that's been really interesting. Um, the other thing I found is, uh, so, so I spent, we spent, we volunteered with the school, but we spent um, most of the time building a, a wall so the children could have a, a bigger play space to play in. So at the minute they're kind of restricted to just a building and they've got a little um, a kind of fenced off gated areas, but it's, it's not very big. So we're building a much bigger, wider wall around their school so they can have a bit more freedom with still the protection of not kind of wandering off or having, uh, there's quite a few dogs in the area as well, so they wouldn't want to come in and kind of have an incident with a dog attacking a child and things like that. Um, so we, that's what we were doing. We were building this wall for the children, but we spent, um, the beginning of each day, we spent maybe 10 or 15 minutes saying hello to the children. And uh, that, was, that was quite interesting to see because there's a few things I've seen, people's photos of people who have gone traveling and worked with young kids in poverty areas and poverty countries. Uh, and I've always thought, oh, them kids that haven't got shoes on their feet in school and things like that. And this must be a really poor area. But actually, that was the case here. But the culture is just to leave your shoes outside. All the children had shoes. They were just at the front door. Uh, the culture is to don't wear shoes indoors. We had to take our shoes off as we went in. So we were just in, in our socks and our stocking feet. And that was kind of brought to reality a little bit that um, sometimes when you see Western people traveling and touring and helping out in these schools, often in the photos, the poverty isn't quite what it seems. Um, my, my, I was talking to my sister about this, who's been traveling a few times. She's done volunteering in poor areas and she's traveled and seen quite a lot of the world. And she she describes these these images as poverty porn, which I think is quite funny. But yeah, so I, f I felt there was an element of poverty porn to the, uh, to the, first, to the first week. Um, but it was fun anyway. It was a good team building activity that we did with the uh, the people we work with. Um, but coming back to the, to to the point of this little this little tale, is the um, is the the difference between being rich and being happy, and being in poverty and being happy. Um, I don't think it's drilled in. I've never believed it. Um, but coming from the Western world, coming from the UK you're always kind of encouraged to think that you're only successful and you don't be happy if you have a secure income, well-paid job and wealthy. But I, I honestly don't think that's the case. Um, these, these people are wonderful, um, but poor and that's great. The other thing that I've noticed is the, um, is the integration between classes as well. So we've been in, in vans or in cars or in the back of a little pickup truck where the, all the health and safety rules here were a bit relaxed. So we've just been sat in the back of a pickup truck going around the place. Um, but you get to see the streets and you get to see the buildings that are here. And there is obviously wealth in Thailand. There is that you do see kind of big um, mansion like houses, but then just next door there'll be a, a shack with a million out of what would be bits of bits of rubbish, bits of corrugated tin sheets and uh, metal sheets and bits of old crates and things like that they've built and there's someone living in the mansion, there's someone living in the, the shack, <clears throat> but they they get on, they, they're outside together, they live in the same street, they live next door to each other and it's it's it, to see the wealthy people and the 
poverty people integrate in, in that way. Um, there doesn't seem to be any judgment, any uh, well, any segregation due to how affluent people are at all. It's just everyone gets along, everyone smiles and happy. And it's uh, it's really interesting. And there are elements of this country, which of Thailand, which I'm, I'm quite jealous of that we don't have in the UK. Um, not so much the, the the difficult conditions that they have here and that it's that a lot of the working day is too hot to work in, which always causes issues. But um, I'm quite jealous that the UK isn't as well and happily integrated um, as it is here. That's been a really interesting eye-opening part of my trip. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'm not very good at these little individual reports, but I'll get better. Um, so that's my first one. Um, so I'll be back in touch again. Thank you, Mr. Frogbit. I hope everyone's, everyone's all right enjoying the autumn in the UK. Bye. Oh, Mark has gone. Oh, where has he gone? Is he having fun or is he on the run? Is he looking after orphaned elephants or is he in the jungle getting bitten by ants? Cos Mark is reporting from somewhere around the world today. Yes, Mark is reporting from somewhere. What has he got to say? So, Mark, talk, Mark, talk. Tell us your tales if you've been swimming with whales. Mark, talk, Mark, talk. Tell us your news if you've been racing emus. Mark, come on, Mark. Lovely, Mark. That's fascinating stuff. Thanks for that, Mark. And we'll have another report in the next episode. Temperature is getting higher, um, but we're not going to have a problem, apparently, according to Michelle Bachman, um, who used to be a, a rep- American representative in Minnesota in Congress. Um, she's a conservative uh, evangelical. Um, now she's serving as a pastor to the United Nations, a pastor, not a pastor, like she's not a dish made with pasta and sauce. Yep. This is what she said. I had one US amb- one UN ambassador who was practically crying when I was in there because I asked all of them, how can I pray for you? Her response was, I want you to pray for climate change and pray for my country because we're going to be underwater. But Pacman told the ambassador she had good news. I want to refer people to the book of Genesis. I would encourage pastors to start preaching on this issue of climate change and God's view of climate change. Yeah, did you know God had a view of climate change? God put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his covenant. And he said very clearly to the entire world. How do you know this, Michelle? You weren't there. Anyway, he said very clearly to the entire world. Never again will there be judgment. Never again will the world be flooded. You can take that to the bank. That's God's word. And what is it these frauds tell us with climate change? That the world's going to be flooded. Isn't it interesting? God says we will never be flooded. Whoa! Thank God for that. Let's you panic over. Extinction Rebellion, everyone, stop now because Michelle Bachman um, knows that God's spoken about climate change and we're not going to be flooded because apparently he said it. And I, I don't know when he said it or where he said it, but thank God someone was there to write it down. So let's just cancel all the demos, cancel everything because the world's going to be okay. Right, as you're probably aware, there's been lots of Extinction Rebellion stuff happening all over the country, but mainly focusing on London. We've had um, Boris Johnson calling them crusties. Yep, doctors, lawyers, scientists, you're all crusties, according to Johnson. This man is the man who leads the country, and he comes out with sort of gross, horrible generalisations about a, a group of people like that. What an absolute twat. Anyway, so there have been people climbing, the man climbing Big Ben. There's been loads of stuff happening, uh, you know, right through London. And there's a bit of controversy, wasn't there? Um, 
a lot of negative stuff uh, recently as well about Extinction Rebellion losing public support. And it's mainly, the articles are mainly from people and the press that never supported them in the first place. But remember, this isn't about getting public opinion on our side. And there was just, there was stuff, wasn't there, in London where people got involved and pulled activists off the roof of a tube. And like people go, well, I thought tubes were electric. Why are they doing this? Why are they doing this around tubes? They're good, aren't they? And it, you've got to remember, it's about creating inconvenience so that governments are forced to act. It doesn't matter if you agree or not. It's about getting governments to act. Oh, but it doesn't work. Well, maybe you should tell Gandhi and the peaceful movement in India that and the American civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, it does work. Uh, okay, though I do slightly worry because it's totally peaceful that Ajahn Provocateur may start getting involved and getting violent to discredit the movement. And I saw, I think it might have been on Facebook or online, there was a, a clip where um, Extinction Rebellion protesters had blocked the traffic, but then they moved apart to let an ambulance come through, uh, which is brilliant. And one of the comments underneath was, well, yes, but they might have delayed the ambulance by a few seconds and that person might have died because of the delay for a, because of the delay for a few seconds. Well, yeah, but, you know, does that mean that you, complaining about it, are never going to drive your car anywhere? Because every time you're in traffic in your car, you might be delaying an ambulance for a few few seconds um or is it a different rule for you twat um anyway the other thing is it's have a go at greta isn't it everybody's having a go at greta all the middle-aged men are having a go at greta piers morgan um had a go at greta this is what it says taking to twitter the 54 year old quoted an article discussing the teenager's nobel hopes fuming about the update he asked his 6.8 million followers what she done for peace exactly she just got very very angry about climate change abused loads of adults and terrified millions of children she's terrified you hasn't she a big wet blanket and another sort of middle-aged twat male, um, Jeremy Clarkson. This is what he said. How dare you sail to America on a carbon fibre yacht that you didn't build, you didn't earn, and has a backup diesel engine that you didn't mention. Pause for a moment to consider how soundly you sleep at night, knowing that adults are building and servicing and flying Sweden's fighter planes. What the fuck are you on about? To keep you safe, we gave you mobile phones and laptops and the internet. We created the social media you use every day and we run the banks to pay for it all. So how dare you stand there and lecture us, you spoilt brat. I'm talking of spoilt brat. Jeremy Clarkson, if you remember back a couple of years, actually punched a fellow co-worker at the BBC because when he got back to his hotel, he didn't have his required meal on the table. So um, pot, kettle, there's a lot of sort of, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, anyway, good on you, Extinction Rebellion activist. Keep it up. Is it okay to talk about drugs? Is it okay to do it anyway? Is it okay to talk about drugs? Is it okay? Get the motor started, they're after us! <laughs> Can you not go any faster? This is a 30 mile an hour speed limit. I'm not breaking the law, you know. But you're a getaway driver! Why have you stopped? This is a pedestrian crossing. It's in the highway code. And anyway, it's Deidre from number 27. I've got to let her cross. <laughs> Why have you stopped again? It's Tuesdays. I got to get a pension from the post office, the post office before the queue builds up. This is the police. Come out with your hands up. That's the last bloody time I'm asking you to drive for us. Yeah, it's true. Britain's oldest getaway driver got sent down this week. Listen up. 
An 81-year-old former burger van worker. I think that's important, the burger van worker bit. But anyway, an 81-year-old former burger van worker who took up work as a getaway driver to overcome his isolation and help an alleged drug dealer flee the UK has been jailed. Ian Hemmons of Chichester was used because his age and appearance meant he would not draw attention. He was prepared to act as a driver because it gave him the chance to have a chat with someone, Portsmouth Crown Court was told. The judge told Hemmons, you would have been aware that you were being used as a driver whose age and appearance would have been unlikely to draw attention. Yeah, yeah, but it probably wasn't the age, the thing, was it, that gives you, where's a getaway driver? It's it's probably the screeching round corners at 90 miles an hour as a police car chases you. That's probably a bigger clue. Um, but anyway, uh, that'll do for us. <laughs> OK, bit of a weird one this week. Right, in this episode of Nature is Clever, um, we're looking at the Saharan silver ants. That's quite a cool name, isn't it? And why is it clever? Well, only because it can run faster than Usain Bolt, and I bet that makes Usain insane. Anyway, the Saharan silver ant has joined the list of world record-breaking animals as researchers from the University of Ulm in Germany have found it is able to run at speeds of 855 millimetres a second, which is 108 times its own body length per second. To put that into perspective, when Usain Bolt set the world record for 100 metres of 2009, he ran at 5.3 times his own body height, and that's doing 108 times its own body length height. Okay, you know, kind of thing. And it says, the tiny ant's impressive speed comes from the fact that it must be fast enough to survive its travels across the blisteringly hot desert. At midday in Duz, Tunisia, while other animals shelter from the hot sun, the Saharan silver ant takes advantage... I've changed accents halfway through that, haven't I? Anyway... The, the Saharan silver ant takes advantage of the lacking predators to scavenge the corpses of less fortunate creatures. Yes, yeah, it's the only one about, and it moves that fast because otherwise it would burn its feet and melt. Well, there you go. You know, maybe if you need a getaway driver, you should enlist the Saharan silver ant because... Now, this could actually also be in the Nature is Clever bit because I've, I've used this in Nature is Clever a bit before because you know me, I'm a big fan of slime moulds, yeah? <laughs> Huge fan of slime moulds. I've mentioned them several times on here. In fact, they've got their own song, so here's the song. I'm a slime mould cowboy I saw it navigate a maze on a YouTube video like a slime mold cowboy It's really, really clever For a one cell slimy lump It's got more brains than Donald Trump Pum, 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 Donald Trump Yep, they're really intelligent for a single-cell being. Well, now they've got their own exhibition, yeah? A Paris zoo has showcased a slime mould dubbed the Blob, a yellowish, unicellular, small-living being which looks like a fungus but acts like an animal. Don't we all? The newest exhibition at Paris Zoological Park, which goes on display to the public on Saturday and is widely used in scientific experiments, has no mouth, no stomach, no eyes, yet it can detect food and digest it. The slime mould, Fasarum polycephalum, almost has um, also has almost 720 sexes. What do you mean almost 720 sexes? Either it's got 720 or it hasn't. If it's almost got 720, hasn't it got 719? Anyway, um, it can move without legs and heals itself in two minutes if cut in half. Um, the blob is a living being which actually belongs to one of Niger's mysteries, said Bruno David. Uh, actually, if he's French, he's probably Bruno David, director of the Paris Museum of Natural History. It surprised us 
because it has no brain but is able to learn. And if you merge two blobs, the one that has learned will transmit its knowledge to the other one, David added. Um, thanks, David. But um, we knew that already. But fancy calling it the blob. How demeaning. Could you? Was it in French? Is it the blurb? Um, well, this is what I'm de <laughs> say demeaning, but this is what demeaning is. Um, the blob was named after 1958 science fiction horror B movie starring a young Steve McQueen in which an alien life form, the blob, consumes everything in its path in a small Pennsylvanian town. And you're calling a slime mole an intelligent creature, the blob. I think that's really insulting. And I'm I'm going to write to my MP about that. The frog did blow. Um, anyway, I'm gonna tell you this. I'm rough with the twat. Tell it like it is. I'm rough with the twat. Tell it like it is. Um, we've not had a laugh at the twats for a while, you know. It's that part of the show where I get a bit mean and mocking and all that peace, love and tolerance goes out the window. And I punch down, don't I? And it's usually related to people and, and how they go on about nature. And look, I know it's not big and it's not clever, but it's fun, isn't it? And we've all got to let off steam sometime, haven't we? And well, this, this time it's about people mistaking water for grass. And the headline is, water joke. <laughs> Get it? Anyway, three people walked straight into a canal after mistaking 60 tonnes of algae in water for a grass lawn. Three people fell into a canal on a night out after mistaking 60 tonnes of algae on the water for a grass lawn. I've just said that bit. Why have I repeated it? Anyway, a teenager plummeted first into the Walsall Canal Basin after a trip to Nando's before a dad and his 11-year-old son also dropped into the water. So we'll do the teenager first. The 19-year-old was walking around the town's waterfront when he fell into the canal, which is swamped with weeds. Unable to swim, the teen just kept his head above water until he was pulled out by friends and a passerby. His mum said the incident, which happened around 7.30pm Friday night, left her son traumatised. Yep, they'll be after the compo there, won't they? The mother of two from Darleston, West Midland. Why, does it, why do we have to know these details? She, anyway, she said, My son, now I don't know, she's from Birmingham, isn't she? My son was just with his friends and so would look like a grass path. So he walked on to it and just fell in. He said he was in there for about 20 seconds. Oh God, can you imagine being in a pond for 20 seconds? And the next sort of semi headline is canal trauma. He, he looked what like we looked. He saw what looked like a tire at the bottom, so we put his foot on it. How did he see a tire at the bottom if it was full of algae and dark? Yeah, you're making that bit up, aren't you? He he saw what looked like a tire at the bottom, so he put his foot on to that and pushed it up. I mean, look like his two friends and a passerby pulled him out. My son can't swim. Well, maybe you should have fucking taught him to swim then. Her, she said her son soaked when he arrived home and she thought he was joking when he told her. That's tragic. The mum, who wished to stay anonymous, addressed, this could happen to anyone. Something needs to be done or are they just waiting for something? want to fall in and die i just thank god he came out with the help of his friends and a passerby i've lost me cockney at birmingham accent now but anyway it's horrible to think about what could have happened yeah an accident you know they do happen don't they and this is what happened to the other two. Steve Worthington, 41, and his son, Lewis, 11, also fell into the canal when they thought the weeds were grass. He battled to keep his lad's head above the water as they desperately tried to clamber to safety. Jesus, never go on a trip to the Amazon, eh? Steve said, We just stepped straight in and went straight under the water. We have never been down there and couldn't see any warning signs in the place. The whole area is thick green weeds. It looks just like grass. What, what What? would the warning sign say? Beware, there's a fucking huge canal right in front of you. Be careful not to jump in. It's like it's like saying all trees need a sign in, someone, in case someone headbutts them by mistake, isn't it? Deary me, anyway, that'll do for... Anyway. 
Anyway, thank you um, once again. Thank you very much for listening. It's available on YouTube if you prefer that. Sorry, last last episode actually took an extra week to get out because I had problems with the um, with the, the host I use and it wasn't able to upload. So you're getting two within a week. I mean, how exciting is that? Thanks to Mark, and we'll be hearing from Mark again as part of his travels because he's already recorded his next bit. Um, have a good fortnight. Keep doing good eco things, and I will speak to you soon then. Bye.